You're welcome. You'll have that in your head all week. Don't worry. You're welcome. Hey, can I just tell you how cool it was? Uh, I was putting the video together this week, and I said to Pastor Seth just yesterday, I said, hey, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'd love to use that song, but I know that if we do that, we'll get pulled off of YouTube. And uh, so I said, so I'll just do something else. And uh, he said, well, what if for on the live stream, we sing it? And then in the room, you can have Journey sing it, but on the live stream, we'll sing it. So they, yesterday, him and, him and Jace, they, they put together a, 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 a part that we could put onto YouTube. So those of you who are watching online right now, you just heard Pastor Seth singing Journey, just so you know. And so uh, we, we'll maybe play that in the room one week as well. Um, We'll see. Uh, but I, I appreciate the talent. For those of you who maybe don't know, uh, one of the songs that we sang tonight was actually written by Pastor Seth as well. So um, very blessed with a very talented staff, and we are excited about what God is doing. I want to take just a moment. I want to talk to our, our uh, campuses that are in Wyoming and Malawi, and I just want to welcome you this weekend, but I also just want to tell you how excited we are. Had some amazing conversations with both of the the pastors from both of those campuses, and God is moving. I'm just going to tell you right now that it's not going to be long before Star Valley is going to need to move to two services and then to a new building. Um, they haven't even started to advertise yet, and they're already they're already just every week seeing more and more people come to church, and so we're super excited about that. And in Malawi, we're going to have to build them a building. It's just the way it is. Um, and so, so we're really excited to see what God's doing. And we just want to welcome you uh, to, to this weekend's gathering. Would you give them a round of applause? Well, we're starting a new series. Oh, I wanted to mention this too real quick. Back at the, uh, where they're selling the sweatshirts and stuff, I mentioned to you last week that we were gonna have these books available. We do have them available. We have a few of them. I think we only have like 25 copies of it. But this is the book Erasing Hell. This is an amazing book that teaches exactly what the scripture says about hell and what that means. And even though there's a lot of people that are trying to erase it out of the scriptures, this digs in and shows you scripture by scripture why there is a reality and it is called heaven and there's a reality that's called hell and we need to understand that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Um, well, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12 and we're going to just dig into one specific chapter because this is an amazing chapter that is really an encouragement. So I, it, was, it was great to hear Pastor Seth as he was praying and talking about maybe you feel like giving up. And, and as we look at this and we unwrap this particular chapter, I, my hope is we called it Don't Stop Believing because this is a chapter that is an encouragement to us as believers to just keep moving forward. So we're gonna start and we're gonna look at just the first few verses. It says this in Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. Let's pray. God, in the next few moments as we look at your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us what we need to see. And I know that, God, even as I begin to preach this message, that there are those who are in this room and those who are within the sound of my voice right now who are on the verge of stopping, of quitting, of giving up, of giving in. And God, I just pray that, Lord, I will get out of the way and your word, which is so powerful, will penetrate even the hardest of hearts. That, God, those who have already even started to make plans as to how they will stop, I pray, God, that, that, that your word will penetrate, that, God, you will do what only you can do. And that, Father, God, we will be encouraged wherever we find ourselves in our faith journey tonight. 
and that we will pursue you with all that we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This is an amazing portion of scripture, and this whole chapter is one of those chapters that you could kind of almost envision, like General Patton in front of the flag giving this amazing speech to the troops, or maybe Vince Lombardi. Come on, Green Bay Packer fans in the room, share with me. Okay, not very many. All right, good. Um, in the locker room and just giving one of these just amazing speeches. This is that speech in the Bible that just says, hey, don't give up. Keep moving. Keep going. You've got this. The author is writing primarily to Jewish people who had converted to Christianity and they found themselves, now life has gotten extremely hard for them. They moved from being just part of a society to being in a place where they were ostracized and and many times they were even, they might have even been beaten or their house taken from them and all these bad things were beginning to happen to them and the author of Hebrews is just saying, hey, don't give up, keep moving and some of you are walking through that difficult season right now and my prayer for you is that, that if you're in the place right now where you're like, my marriage is on the brink, I'm about to stop, that during these next few weeks, God will encourage you that you need to keep moving forward. Maybe you're in a place where, where one of your, ch- your children isn't speaking to you or you're, you're in a hard space there and I want you to know that in these weeks, I want you to hear, don't quit, keep going. Maybe it's your faith and you're like, man, I just, I feel like there's a wall between me and God. And I don't really understand why when I pray, it just feels like it's bouncing off the ceiling. And I'm telling you, don't stop. Keep going. We're going to spend some time over these next few weeks, just digging into this extremely important chapter All of God's word is super important, but I think that as we look at this, you're going to glean some things that maybe you didn't, you hadn't before if you've read it. And I want to just encourage you over these next few weeks, every week I want you to open up the book of Hebrews, and if you don't read any more, read at least chapter 12, but I want to encourage you maybe over the next few weeks to read chapter 1 and 2 this week and chapter 12, and then just next, the next week, read the next part that you haven't read, because there's something about being in God's word and having us as a body study it together, amen? Amen. So uh, as we look at this, at this particular chapter, I want us to understand that there is, there is hope when we, when we apply God's word to us. I want this to bring you hope in uncertain times. We are becoming a nation and a world that's even more divided than ever before. We watch people who will sit and they'll argue and defend their political parties and candidates uh, looking for the flaws in the other side. And we can very easily get trapped in this rabbit hole that has no eternal value. But fortunately, we are not of this world. We do not have a candidate. We have a king. And his kingdom's forever. See, we can get trapped going, well, what if? And oh, man, if if my party isn't in power, what's going to happen? And again, we had a whole series called Last Kingdom So we'd be reminded of the fact that we don't have a candidate, we have a king. Today in these first few verses, the author is talking about things that would maybe make us stop. And so I want us to to dig into this a little bit because if we're honest today, maybe you are in a place where you feel like stopping. You feel like, man, my marriage is a struggle and I don't think it's going to make it through this next year or my job and I'm having a hard time or, or coming to church and being involved or, or maybe it's a ministry that you tried to start and it's not working the way that you thought it would. And so you're in this place of stopping and even as I was writing that today, I was thinking to myself, there are so many times in my own life where, where I'll, I'll wake up on a Saturday morning and I'll, I'll know that I've got something prepared and that we've got a long day of a lot of stuff that we're going we're gonna to dig into. And, and, and my, my mind will start going like, oh man, what if we don't have enough volunteers? What if people don't come out? What if it's a weekend and everybody goes camping instead of coming to church? And you said, all the smart people came here because it's going to rain like crazy tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry for those of you who are watching online from your campsites. Um, But I can get to a place where there's a lot of, there's times, not a lot, but there are times when I don't really want to get up here. I feel like stopping. I struggle at times. We all, if we're honest, have those moments where we feel like stopping. 
And so I want us to look at this because there's a lot of reasons that maybe we would stop, but as we look at this, we need to realize that you may be here today and you may feel drained and you may feel like giving up, but the author of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians who understood what real pressure looked like. They understood what it was like to feel like your world is being turned upside down. And he's saying, but even though you have a reason to feel like stopping, I'm telling you, don't stop. Keep going. So today I want to just break this down a little bit so that we can look at some of the reasons that we may end up stopping short. And the first one is, oftentimes I believe that we lose our frame of reference. Let me explain what that means. As we look at this verse, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life, uh, to the life of faith. So what is he referring to? We oftentimes will take the Bible and we'll break it into these chapters and we'll say, oh, this is the whole point is within this chapter. Can I tell you, those numbers were added later on. This was a letter. So if we were to go back to chapter 11, we'd understand what he's talking about right here because what he's referring to is he had spent all of chapter 11 talking about great men and women of faith and, the, and the, the hard things that they went through, but what they endured and how God stepped into their story. And so now he comes to chapter 12 and then he says, you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, you, you, these men and women of God who've done amazing things, they're part of your story now too. Now, I'll be honest with you because my whole life, I thought that, that maybe what they were referring to is that as if there was like this Colosseum somewhere and, and now I'm out on the, on the floor of the Colosseum and all of these great men and women of the faith are all watching me. Now, I don't know if, if that's how you've ever read that. You, you know, you're surrounded by this great crowd of witnesses. Listen to the people of faith that, that, were, that he's talking about in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, it says, By faith these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of a sword. Their weakness, their weakness was turned to strength. How many of you would like your weakness to be turned to strength? How many of you would like tomorrow to wake up, look in the mirror, and that thing that you think of as your weakness, you go, wow, actually I'm quite strong because of that thing. They became strong in the battle and put whole armies to flight. So as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about these men and women of scripture. We're talking about, you know, your Daniels and we're talking about your Rahabs and we're talking about, about your, your, your Moses and all of these great, amazing people. But I had, and part of it was I read a John Maxwell book at one point and he, he described it as though we come into the, the auditorium and they're all watching us. But I, I, I got to I gotta push back on that a little bit because it's a little weird to me. And I don't know if you've ever lost somebody. They, they've passed on and, and someone will say, man, they just are watching you. And they just, they just, they're so proud of you. And they, they see you from heaven. And I, I'm just going to be real for just a minute. And I hope I don't offend anybody with this. But I'm just going to tell you right now, if I live my whole life so that I get to go to heaven, if my heaven experience is that I'm just going to sit up there and watch my kids and see what they're doing, I think that's kind of boring. I mean, I'd like a highlight reel from what they're doing, I guess, but I don't really want to sit. Because Logan, when he was young, man, he got his first iPod Touch. And so it was the very first, like, camera that he had, right? And so he would set that thing literally in his room and hit the video record button and just record himself going about his life. And then, which is bad enough, but then he'd want me to watch it. I'm like, dude, I don't even go in your room to watch you play anyhow. I don't want to watch it on the TV. There weren't a lot of smash and the like buttons on that one. So I'm thinking to myself, like, is that what it means? Does it mean like these amazing heroes of the faith, now they're all sitting in some auditorium somewhere, and they're, they're like, hey, check it out, Jason's about to binge watch another thing on Netflix. This is going to be exciting. Get your popcorn. And I hope not, because that's a really letdown on what I thought heaven was going to be like. So as we look at this verse, what we need to understand is that's not at all what they're saying. What's happening is they are witnesses to us of God's faithfulness. So we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. What that means is we are surrounded by people who've already lived and experienced, and we get to draw on their experience so that we can have inside of us this, this uh, will to move on. A frame of reference is important. 
The way that we see things is important. See, when we talk about them being a great crowd of witnesses, it's so we can say, they did it and I can too. They survived that, so I absolutely can survive this. We need to relook at the stories of these people who are not capable. Their problems are bigger than them. They weren't great. They were just surrendered. Many of us want the victory without the surrender. In other words, we want the miracle without submitting to the miracle maker. We've got we've to reframe our thought process. We've got to understand that no matter how big your problem is, your God is bigger. The, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us that all of these people went before you and faced extremely hard things. And he reminds us that God was there for them just as he is there for us. Frame of reference is a powerful thing. How we frame things can have a huge impact in the way that we see them. So if you've ever been in like a, a uh, maybe a, even an argument with your spouse or with a friend and, and then the next thing you know, you're, you're sending a text message back and forth to each other and now all of a sudden your frame of reference is things were tough in the last conversation we're having. So now I'm gonna frame this conversation in that, in that idea that it's tough and now we're reading into things. A lot of us, we read into things because our frame that we've decided to put around our circumstance is not a frame of faith, but it's a frame of our lack of ability and our and lack of strength. But if we begin to start to frame things with the understanding that God is bigger and that he is able, what if, for some of you, you may, have, you may be having struggles inside of your marriage right now, and so it, your wedding photo is framed with, with betrayal. Your wedding photo is framed with, with lack of trust. Your wedding photo is framed with struggles that you've had. Your wedding photo is framed with all these things. So every time you look at that, that's all you see is that frame. What if instead you framed it with faith and with understanding and with forgiveness and with love and now all of a sudden when you see that you begin to understand that's what my marriage is. Your child who is not talking to you right now, who you're struggling with, who doesn't want anything to do with God or whatever that story is for you, you've got that picture of your child and you've got all of these things that are, that are your lack or the things that you could have done differently and all of those things that you've written around that picture, what if instead you change that frame and it begins to say, yeah, but even in the fire, he's there. Even in the lion's den, he shut their mouths. Even, in, even when the battle wasn't won yet, he stopped the sun and it stood still because that's the God that I serve. We just sang, I've seen you move. Why do we sing that? It's a reminder to us, God, I've seen you move. You've moved the mountains in my life. I've seen you do incredible things. And so we sing it, why? To remind us so that we can reframe our story. Because it's super easy to frame our story as one of, man, it's been a hard week. Man, things have been a struggle. Man, my job I don't know about. Man, I don't know about my relationships. All these things, and we can frame it in the negative, but we sing a song like that so that we can say, God, I've seen you move in me. You've moved mountains for me before. So now I'm going to believe that again, that even in the middle of the thing that I'm struggling with the most today, I'm believing that you are a God that moves mountains. Yeah. I'm believing that you are a God that when Joshua said, the battle's not done and I need a little bit more time, God said, I got a plan. We'll, we'll stop the sun from moving. Yeah. Because that's the God that we serve. God didn't love Joshua more than he loves you. Do you know that? You may sit in the room and you may feel like, man, I, I, you know, I, I'm just lucky they let me in here. I'm telling you right now, from the beginning of time, before he even spoke this place into existence, he saw you. He loved you. He had a plan for you. And so you can't come into this place and go, yeah, but that's Joshua, because that's, jo you know, that's, that's not me. That's Joshua. No, God loves you. And if the sun needs to stand still to change your story, that's the God that we serve. He can make the sun stand still. We may not be where we want to be, but we're not where we used to be, and we're certainly not where we deserve to be. 
That's because he loves you so much. We, second reason that we stop is because we're weighed down or tripped up. Verse 1, part B. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. This verse is pretty specific about the fact that sin easily trips us up. It easily stops us. It easily puts us in a place where we miss the mark, where we, where we don't get to experience what God has for us because we get ensnared with things that we should never be ensnared with. This is an interesting verse because it's a running analogy which seems ungodly to me. Um, I know some of you love running, and while I love you, I don't understand you. Whenever I'm running, all I can think is, how long do I have to do this? <laughs> we did a 5K run years ago uh, called I Run for Kicks, and it was the way that we raised money so that we could give kids school shoes at the end of the summer. And so we did it a couple of years. And so the first year, I'm like, man, I don't run at all, so I better do this because they're going to expect the pastor of the church to run. So I, I started running, and I have all these people who are runners and they'd come to me and they'd go, listen, you just keep this up and all of a sudden you're going to be addicted to it. I'm like, I don't think the Bible wants me to be addicted to anything. So... Amen. <laughs> we, we did this 5K and it was amazing because... Uh, we, we did it, I ran it, and I haven't done it since. Uh, but we had some of the firemen come out, and they were like, hey, we want to support what you guys are doing. Super cool. And so they came out to run. Well, one of the guys shows up, and he's got all of his gear on, down to even the oxygen tank and the helmet and the mask. And, he's, and he run, it's August. And he runs it in that stuff. I mean, you got to, did not make me feel great because he almost beat me. Um, actually, he might have beat me. I, I don't remember, actually. Um, but he had all this extra gear, and he's running with it. And, and I, I just, as I was thinking about this analogy, this is an amazing analogy, because for many of us, uh, he's, the author is saying, listen, you need to run this thing, and you need to understand that there are going to be things that are going to trip you up. There are going to be things that you're carrying. And for many of you, you're having a hard time running because you're carrying so much stuff. For some of you, you've allowed shame of your past to be this weight that, that you're carrying and you're trying to figure out, man, I see people running, but I don't understand how they're running. But yet you've got this backpack full of stuff that you're carrying that you don't need to carry anymore. Society says that the way to freedom is to do whatever you want. But the writer of Hebrews says, actually, that isn't freedom, that's bondage. It tangles you up. People think that following God's commands is a burden, but actually living contrary to the creator is the biggest burden of them all. Often when we release things to God, he replaces them with better things. That's an important one because a lot of us, we fight to hold on to stuff because we feel like that's the thing that, that fulfills me. That's the thing that makes me happy. That's the thing that if I can have that. So then when we talk about our faith journey, we've got this, we've got this thing on the side that, yeah, as long as I can have this, then, I'll, then I'll, I'll reach my hand into faith every once in a while so that I feel good about myself. But the reality is, is when we actually put all, when we, when we strip all that stuff down and we go, you know what, I don't need that anymore, so I'm going to just pursue him with all my heart, with everything that I am, then all of a sudden he steps into our story and he actually, he takes those things that we've released and he replaces them with something better. So those of you who sit in the room today and you've been, you've been addicted to drugs before. And you understand what that's like to have that thing just own you. And then you found freedom in Christ. And now you, you look back and you're like, man, that was really hard what life was like before. But now because I've experienced the freedom of Christ, I understand what life should look like. When I was uh, just new in ministry, I was actually, many of you maybe don't know this, but I was engaged to someone else. I was dating someone. I asked her to marry me. We were going to get married. And... Uh, at that point, I realized this is not a really great relationship for me. 
And so, but in my head, I had already made this commitment. So I was like, I'm going to stick with it and I'm going to, I'm going to persevere and I'm going to push through. And I, I, and my, I had people in my life saying, I don't think this is the right relationship for you. And I just, I just kept pushing and just, you know, then I kind of got stubborn. I don't know if any of you ever get stubborn. I got a little bit stubborn. And I just kept holding on and holding on and trying to like make it work. And the day came when I finally had to realize, like, I got to let this go. I got I to gotta, I gotta not be with this person anymore. And so we broke it off, and I was like, I'm done. I'm not going to date anymore. This is ridiculous. And it wasn't too long after that that I, I got to spend some time with my wife. See, the thing that I was fighting so hard to hold on to, once I released, God brought me something way, way better. We've got to strip off what hinders you. Many today are running and you're carrying a weight that Jesus paid to remove from you. He already paid the bill. You're carrying it and he must just go, why are you carrying that? I paid for it. I paid so you won't have to carry that anymore. Let it go. The third thing that often stops us is we lose sight of what we are supposed to focus on. Jesus is where we are supposed to focus. He initiates and he perfects our faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Or one translation says, he is the developer and completer of our faith. Think about this for just a moment. If if you were to go, and, and we live in a, in a subdivision that is now, they're starting to do a lot of building, just like everywhere else in Missoula, apparently. And so there's a developer. There's somebody that that's, their job is to decide where the houses are going and what they're going to look like. And, and, they're, and then we, there's a builder, and all of those things take place. But when Jesus is the one that says, listen, I see in you, I understand what I've designed you to be. And so when we allow him to be the one that builds us, When we keep our eyes on him, when we focus on him, then he will be the author and the finisher of your faith. He will be the one that completes you. But for many of us, we take our eyes off of him, and and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a big mess, in a messy situation, and then what happens is oftentimes after we've taken our eyes off of him, we've decided that we think we can do things on our own, in our own power, with our own strength, then all of a sudden we are in a mess, and when we get into that mess, who do we blame? We blame him. And he's like, dude, I'm, that's not how I was designing this thing. That's not how I had planned it. You took your eyes off of me. You stopped listening to me. You started doing your own thing, and now it's messy, and you're trying to put it on me. The Bible says that if you'll fix your eyes on him, if you'll, if you'll keep your eyes on him, if you'll continually look to him for the answers, then all of a sudden you will begin to realize that he is not only the, 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 the builder of you, he is, a, he is the best builder there is. My parents and my sister just recently built a new home and, and, and we were in there the other day and we were just looking at, man, how amazing the building is and, and, and the fine details and how great it is. And, and, and when, they, when they built this house, they, the builder put his name out in front of the house so that people would know he is the builder. Why? Because he has a good reputation in this town. So when they see it, they go, oh, that's a good house. That's a good builder. I know that because that name is on it. And can you imagine if, if Jesus' name is on us? That's a good building. That's a good house right there. But in order for him to put his name on us, we have to keep our eyes on him. We gotta pursue him, we gotta chase him, we gotta believe him, we gotta take him at his word. He built it, and if he builds it, he stands behind it. How many of you know there's no warranty like Jesus' warranty? If you allow him to build you, then he'll stand behind you. He's the one that, that created you. He's the one that designed you. He's the one that has a great plan for you. So what that means is sometimes it's going to get hard. Just because we keep our eyes on Jesus doesn't mean that life just becomes just this super easy thing and we just get to skip through life and we have no problems. No, but it means that when problems arise, we got the builder stamp on us. 
And he is more than happy to come in and fix what needs to be fixed and to take care of what needs to be taken care of. So when a storm rises, you know I've been built by the best. I'm built to weather the storm. This evening, as we spend a little bit of time afterwards with just a little bit of worship, I wanted to take some time and I wanted us to go into communion. And as we look at this particular passage of scripture, the the part that we looked at ended with, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people then you won't become weary and give up. So his joy was the completed work in you. The joy that was set before him was he, he was about to endure something that you and I can't even imagine. We can't even fathom what Jesus was about to go through. But inside of that, he said, the joy that I find is that I know that by doing this, that in East Missoula in 2021, that, that there's going to be people that are sitting there and because of what I'm about to do, I can have right relationship with them because I'm gonna pay the price so they don't have to carry the weight anymore because I've paid for it. And this verse is amazing because it says, listen, he went through from a place of honor. He went to this thing where he endured all this hostility from sinful people. And, and he did it so that you and I won't get weary and give up. He's like, I, I'm going to see this all the way through because I know that there are going to be people on, uh, that are going to be people that, that are going to know me and they're going to come to a place where they feel like, man, I'm going to stop. I'm going to quit. I'm going to give up. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you, you can go all the way through. You can finish what's in front of you. You can finish this race that I've placed you on and you can not stop. Amen. See, as hard as our life is, it's not as hard as what Jesus did. So if he can finish it, you and I can finish it. You and I can finish it. Don't stop. Don't stop. No matter how hard it feels today, don't stop. No matter how much you feel like quitting today, don't you stop. God is good. He's great, actually. Come on, Jimmy. God is great all the time. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't quit. I know it feels hard. I know you feel alone, but you're not alone. Fix your eyes on him. Put your hope in him. Put your trust in him. You're surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses who have already been down roads even harder than the road you're on. And God stepped into their story. Can't even imagine, like, we're having a bad day, and man, my family, my family, we're struggling, this and that. And all of a sudden, the author of Hebrews is like, hey, Joshua, come here for a minute. Talk to him about, remember that battle you were in? And man, it was hard and it was, it was bloody and it didn't look like you were going to pull it out. And, and so you prayed and, and tell me what happened. This is a good part. Listen, listen to what Joshua has to say right here. Well, yeah, I prayed and, and God said, oh no, you got to finish the battle. So I'm going to just stop the sun in the middle of the sky. It'll be cool. And you'll finish the battle and you'll win. See, we have a crowd of witnesses and you go, hey, man, I don't really know. Well, get in the word and you'll know. Dig in, and all of a sudden, you'll begin to see, oh, wait, that's the God that I serve. He's big. He's able, and he wants to. It's a great reminder for you because some of you, man, it's, it's a struggle right now, and you're having a hard time. But today, I'm going to ask you to do something. As we go to the communion table and we spend just a little bit of time together just remembering what Jesus did, remember that, that it was his joy that was set in front of him. Why? Because he knew what completion looked like. It's not the cross. He wasn't like, oh, yay, the cross. No, it was the completion of the cross that he, was the joy. It was what it means to you and I that was the joy. 
So as we go to communion and whatever your struggle is today, whatever you're having a hard time with, I'm going to ask you to do something. And, and before you, you, you break open the little thing and take the wafer and put it in your mouth, I'm going to ask you to just say, God, you endured so much more than I'm in the middle of right now. So I'm going to take what this thing is, this struggle that I'm having, and I'm going to lay it at your feet, and I'm going to say, God, I will finish the race. I will not quit. I'm not going to stop. And you're going to hand it to him, and I'm going to believe with all my heart that in that moment, something's going to change. Something's going to be different inside of you because now your frame of reference is different. And when the enemy comes in and starts telling you all the reasons why it isn't going to work, you remind him of the crowd of witnesses and what God's already done. Watch what he does. If, you've, if you receive the, the emblems on your way in, then you'll, in just a few moments you can just take them whenever you're ready. If you didn't receive any, there's some in the back, back there that you can make your way back there in just a moment when we start to sing. And you're more than welcome to participate with us in that. But I'm going to pray over our communion time together. And then I'm just going to ask that whenever you feel led to do it, I'm also going to ask that our prayer teams make their way down here and they'll be ready if you need prayer for anything. If you're in the middle of it and you just need somebody to come alongside you and pray and say, say, God, I, I, I want to finish the race, but I, I need you. God's faithful. You close your eyes with me for the next few moments. God, we are so grateful that you loved us so much. But we can't even comprehend that in the middle of going to the cross, it's the joy that was set before you that you loved us that much, that you endured something so horrific because you love us. So Father, today as we take these emblems on our own, God, I know that as we, as we eat what represents the bread, God, that it represents your body that was broken for us. Not because we deserved it, but because you so loved us. Lord, as we drink that cup, it's your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and for our healing. And God, you, you're so good and it's so incredible. So Father, I just pray that we will not take that lightly, but Lord, I also pray for a healing of our mind as we take communion. That God, you'll change our frame of reference that God, for those who are within the sound of my voice right now, those who are, are watching in Malawi and, and, and in Wyoming and those who are watching at home, that in this moment right now, God, as we, as we spend some time changing our frame of reference, that God, you would speak to us and help us to understand that you are all powerful and that there's nothing that's too big for you. Those relationships that seem dead and gone, Lord, we, we, we breathe life back into them today. God, we're not going to stop. We're not going to quit. We're going to keep going. We're going to win this race. We're going we're gonna to run it the way you've asked us to run it. Father, we give you all the praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship with us? You can take communion whenever you're ready.